to show you where we're going, I was uh, putting together this demo in my office, and uh, this is going to be very basic, but we're going to take we're taking baby steps today. Okay, here uh, we're going to get two tracks or two layers set up. Okay, and we're going to have two synthesizers that are kind of playing individual parts. That when we play them together, they make a uh, sound like this. I probably need to plug in. Okay, so when I play. Very basic, okay. So <laughs> uh, that's what we're gonna build here today with this demo, okay? You guys ready? You've got keyboards, you've got logic open, okay? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start from scratch as well. Uh, I want you to create a new project from templates like we've been doing, okay? And when you get to this screen, we uh, let's see, there are a number of templates out here for various genres. Uh, we're not going to use those uh, at first. We're going to kind of take baby steps. But if you uh, want to explore those on your own as you're starting to develop your ringtones for uh, for project two, uh, feel free to explore those at a later time. But we're going to create an empty project. Um, let's see. Do you guys have these options down here at the bottom, or is there like a drop down list that you can get to them, or no? If not, I'll skip over it for now. I don't. Here's a little details. Here. the details. Okay. Uh, the only thing I was going to say is I want to start with a l slower tempo, so I'm going to do that, but I'll show you how to change that when you get into um, Logic as well. So I'm going to hit Choose, and the first thing it's going to do is ask me to create a new track like we've done before, yes? But at this time, instead of an audio track, I want you to create a software instrument track, okay? That's the one that I want you to create. And the option that I want you to pick for instrument is this ES1. It's down here below the ESP. So ES1, and you can go ahead and choose stereo. So ES1 stereo is what you want to choose for your instrument. Uh, you should have this output already set to output one and two, but if not, you can just double check to make sure it's going to output one and two. Okay. And when you hit create on this, you're going to get a new track that looks a little different than the audio tracks we had before, yes? We've got a little picture, a little graphic uh, of this little uh, mini synthesizer, yes? It's actually kind of a cartoonish reduction of a mini Moog, okay? Um, but at this point, you should, if you have the keyboard attached to your attached to your computer, which you do by plugging into the back of the computer, right? Uh, you should be able to play the keyboard and have it actually create sound. Is everybody getting sound from their musical keyboard at this point? If you did not select this keyboard, if you did not pick up a hardware keyboard, you probably have this musical typing that popped up. Uh, and it actually maps onto keys on your computer keyboard for you to play with. Okay, so you can test those out as well. I just want to make sure everybody's getting sound at this point. Okay, so this musical typing keyboard is is handy um, if you don't have a hardware keyboard to attach to it. We have these in the lab, so if you're working on projects uh, in the lab, you want to go ahead and, and I mean, if, if you're more comfortable with a physical musical keyboard. Uh, feel free to grab them and pull them out. Uh, you do, when you're done, need to pack them back up and put them away. The reason we don't leave them out all the time, as you can see, once we have 20 people with keyboards out, it takes up a lot of uh, real estate on the desks, yes? So that's the reason why we have them slide over to the side and then pull them out as you need them, okay? Uh, the other thing is um, this with this musical typing keyboard, you can get to this. The keystroke, uh, it's in the window, yes, right here, musical typing. The keystroke is actually command K. So if you need the musical typing keyboard, you can get to it that way, okay? Um, so we've set up this new project. We've uh, attached uh, our, our one synthesizer layer here. Uh, there's one, we're going to use musical time, so we don't need to change the musical grid, but what's the one other step that I mentioned in terms of a new project that we need to do before we get started on anything? Save, yes, okay, so 
Uh, as this is a habit you want to get into early in your careers, okay? So go to save, and the thing that I want to um, not gloss over this time, I'm going to go ahead and save mine to the desktop, but um, in the details, in the options, let's see, if you have a drop-down menu, you should have an option that looks something like this. Um, I found from working with a few people that it actually stores better if you pick folder here rather than package. Some people, when they went to go zip their projects that were a package, it was stalling on them. So I would get in the habit of saving it as a folder rather than a package. Okay. Um, so you can save this right onto your hard drive for this project uh, or right onto your USB stick. Or uh, if you need to do that later, you can save it onto the desktop and then you can copy it over to your, your, dr your drive so you have it and you can move between machines, okay? Uh, I'm going to save it as a folder. Um, these other options, you can check them if you'd like. Uh, but basically, what this, what this is, uh, copy the following files. This is logic wanting to know, like, how many of those ingredients should I keep a copy of in your project folder? Or how many, and how many of them should I leave where they originally um, were on your hard drive, okay? The more you check on this list, the more files it's going to grab and pull into your project. So you've got a self-contained project, and you're assured that everything you need for your project is in your project folder. Does that make sense? That's what this checklist is. So... Um, right now, it doesn't matter as much, but as we get into things like sound designing for movie, you might want a copy of your movie file in your project so you know that it's all self-contained in that folder together, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and save mine to the desktop, and I'm going to hide logic just to show you. So now I now have, this is my done demo that I started class with, but I have my demo 0206, and if I double-click that to show you, You'll see that I've got a folder, but then I've also got this folder underneath. This audio files folder is where some of those clips that you, if you bring in recorders from the, uh, recordings from the Marantz, they'll end up in this audio files folder. Uh, this .logicx file is actually the thing that you can use to launch your project, but the thing that you would need to zip if you were handing this in at this moment would be this entire demo 0206 folder, okay? I point this out just so you can see that this is the thing that you would want to hit control, compress, and now I've got a zip file that serves the purpose that I was after on that first project, okay? Uh, so I'm going to get back into logic. Now that I've got my project set up, I've got a, an instrument on a track, I've got a keyboard, okay? Um, let's talk about the preset that I want you to use. I want you to use what's called the Vintage Classic preset, okay? Uh, what do I mean by preset? Well, when you're when you were dealing with a software instrument, it's going to have an interface, but it's also going to have a set of kind of like preset settings of that interface that result in a timbre that's specific to the name, okay? Um, what I mean by that, you should have on the left-hand side here something that looks like this. Whoop. Does everybody have this library panel on the side? If you don't, uh, it's this drawer icon that makes it hide or show. Okay, so if it disappears on you at some point, you can get it back by hitting this little drawer icon. And you'll see something that gives you a list of like a, a menu with options. So under synth leads, there's an option called vintage classic. Okay, that's going to be a, that's what's called a preset that gives you a certain sound out of your software synthesizer. Okay. And if you play it now, you'll notice that it sounds a little bit different. Okay. So a few things to note about this. So uh, what you'll notice with the Vintage Classic is if you play one key, you get a note. So if you play a second key, what's what's going on there? I'm playing four notes right now, but I'm only hearing one of them. Are we getting that same behavior out of theirs? Okay. Oh, excuse me. So, what's going on there? Does anybody know? Okay. This C this preset is what's called monophonic. Okay, and I believe it, I'm pretty sure this was in chapter eight, basically, but it might have been in that. 
uh, inundation of information about synthesizers, basically. Okay, but two flavors that uh, keep that uh, synthesizers come in are monophonic and polyphonic. Okay, monophonic keyboards, monophonic synthesizers can only play one pitch at a time. Okay, so no matter how many keys I press on the keyboard, I'm only going to hear one tone. Okay. If this was a polyphonic setting, which is actually what I had in the beginning, let's go see if I undo. No. Let's see. Oh, I'm still getting a monophonic, okay? I'd have to go back digging for a polyphonic synthesizer, okay? But the opposite of monophonic is polyphonic, okay? Polyphonic synthesizers can play multiple notes, multiple pitches. Monophonic can only play one pitch at a time, okay? Uh, it's important that you understand that this is, this is a feature, not a bug, okay? Uh, so if you're trying to play chords, if you're trying to play intervals together, okay, uh, you want to make sure you have a polyphonic synthesizer if that's what you're trying to achieve out of your single uh, synthesizer, okay? Um, so let's see. Uh, that's, these are the presets, okay? And that's going to get you probably 80% of the way toward customizing your sound. But if you, if you want to get into the deep end, if you want to get into the last 20%, you're going to need to open up the, soft, the interface for this software. And then you do that, let's see, we have this representation of the track here that we've been dealing with. But we also have this kind of mixer view of the track down here. And on it, there's this, you notice it says ES1 right here. If you click right in the middle of it, it's going to open up a new software interface for you, which might look intimidating at first, yes? Okay, you may have trouble getting that. Uh, what Kiera was ex experiencing is something I want to make sure you guys know about. So just like you can hide the library and show it, you can hide and show this uh, mixer panel right here. So this I is going to hide and show this mixer panel that you need to get to this ES1 interface, okay? Uh, so, I said it looks a little intimidating at first, but do you see some of those terms that I had up on my slide about 20 minutes ago when I was talking about synthesizer features? What do you see here that looks like something I mentioned about 20 minutes ago? Chase? Uh, the wave. The wave, okay, where do you see that? Um, top left. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so top left, we've got wave here. Uh, what's another term right here? Yeah. <laughs> Cut off, okay. For the filter, okay. So I mentioned filter before, okay. So we've actually got a filter control right here. But let's get back over here. So we were dealing with the wave. Uh, do these little yeah. goofy looking waveforms look familiar? Uh, we've got sawtooth, triangle, square, and pulse. Okay, so it's showing you in a kind of really reduced fashion, and this is not uncommon for software synthesizers to do, is to show you one cycle of the waveform, rather than writing out the word triangle, this little triangle icon is a much, uh, much more efficient way to convey that information to you, okay? Uh, so you can actually select which waveform you want with this knob here, and which waveform you want your oscillator to be using, okay? So this is your oscillator control over here. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about the filter over here. What about down here? Anything look familiar down in this quadrant? It's yeah, there's that ADSR I was talking about, okay? And again, it's very common for these synthesizers to truncate things, and rather than write out attack, decay, sustain, release, it just says ADSR. You've got a control for each one of them, okay? And it even says envelope down here, okay? So these are very common elements, very common components that are found on software synthesizers of different stripes and varieties. So whether you're working with the ES1 or you're working with some other paid uh, software synthesizer, you're going to find these components, these elements repeat and are found on uh, a lot of different synthesizers that are out there on the market, both of the software and the hardware variety. Okay, that's my reason for pointing them out to you. Okay, um, you can get a lot of mileage out of changing these. So let's see, we we want we have our sawtooth waveform. If you go ahead and change it over to a square wave and note the difference in sound versus okay, some very basic timbres, but you should be able to hear some differences in the way those sound. Okay. 
Um, the uh, let's see. The filter gives us control over the cutoff because right right now this is configured to be a low pass filter, and so if I take this cutoff slider and I everybody hear how it gets brighter and darker. I'm basically just playing a key on the keyboard over and over again here, okay? And then finally with the ADSR, you can increase the attack time. Or make it shorter. Same thing, uh, the A and the R are probably the most audible in terms of hearing the results. So. Okay. So, again, what what looks like a complicated uh, interface, if you break it down into its components, it's a lot easier to understand what each part does. Okay, that's my point in showing you this. Okay, um, let's actually record something with this. Okay, uh, the chapter talks about two different types of entry. Um, the real-time entry and manual entry, and I want to make sure I, I, I give you kind of a preview of how to do each of these inside of Logic, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and... I'm happy with that sound. I'm going to go ahead and close this window and go back over here to uh, the timeline, okay? And if I ever need to get that back, I can just click on it again and it'll pop back up, okay? Uh, I'm going to go to the timeline, and I want to actually create... I want to uh, record a little loop with my first layer, with my first synthesizer, okay? Um, the thing that I recommend doing in, in, uh, when you're creating kind of little components of your music is to actually turn on the looping function. You can do that if you uh, just simply click in this range and you should see a gold bar show up. Yes? I, I, again, I clicked right about here where these numbers are. And a gold bar should show up that actually encompasses from one to the start of the five, yes? Did we get that? Okay. What that's going to do, this is the looping function, and it's now going, Logic is now going to loop these four bars over and over and over again, okay? Whether we're playing the, this uh, piece or whether we're recording into it, okay? Which is a useful function if you can only record a little bit at a time. You can actually uh, layer new things in. You can do what's called overdubbing, dubbing a new, a little bit of uh, uh, each time you go back through the loop, okay? It's called overdubbing, okay? So I've got the loop function on. You've got the gold bar here, okay? The other thing you want to be aware of is this metronome. You can see this icon sort of similar to this, yes? Um, or it just says click, okay? I'm going to go ahead and uh, press this, basically. What that does is that when I hit play now, I get a click, which lets me know where I am in my rhythmic structure. Okay. That's probably beyond the scope of my demo today, but yes, you could, you, yeah, you can get in here and you can tweak it to whatever you want it to sound like, this metronome, okay? Uh, but the default is good enough for now, okay? Uh, if your tempo is not this slow, or if you want it to be slower, you'll see right here in this display, there's this BPM, which stands for beats per minute, for those of you that are not familiar with musical terminology. The, s the lower this number is, the slower the tempo is going to be. And the higher the tempo is... <coughs> yeah, I would recommend... Hey, whoa. I did something there. Now my face is in the background, sorry. Um, oh, I guess I need to... Yeah. I recommend starting slow, okay? Especially for real-time entry for, for entering on a keyboard. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm I am not that proficient with a musical keyboard. I will I'll be, you know this is my confession here to you today. Okay, uh, so I need to when I'm recording with a musical keyboard record things very slowly. Okay, and then you can the nice thing about MIDI is that you can then speed them up to the tempo you eventually want it to go. Okay, so if you're someone like me that struggles with entering things on the keyboard or you don't even know how to use this keyboard, uh, you can start very slowly entering things very gradually and then increase the tempo later, okay?
So I'm going to record uh, my initial layer here. Okay. The first thing I need to do is I need to make sure that this track is record enabled. You see, if I hover over this R, it's 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 red. Your, shoot, your your button here should be red, and it should say record enable. Okay. Uh, and then where did my transport go? Oh, it's I think it's because I made this smaller. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So if I turn on the record here now at the transport, it's ready to start recording. There's, it kind of turns red, and it's going to come back around, and I'm going to record the first part of my layer here. Two, ready, go. As soon as I let go, it's going to start playing back. See how I did that? Try this out for yourself on your computer, please. Make sure you have this process down for real-time entry. And you don't have to re necessarily record my segment, but just practice recording something more of ours. And give yourself some space to record with the other segment. Looks like most of you have got that recorded. The last thing I'll just point out, I mentioned this word overdubbing, okay? I flew this first note, so I could actually jump in here and say, see how it added another layer there on top of the loop that I already recorded. Because I still had it record enabled, because I still had it recording, it's going to just merge those together right now in the next time through the loop, okay? So you can actually add components each time through the loop as long as it's still record enabled, okay? Okay? So that's one layer. How do we get a second layer? Well, uh, we can add a track, okay? Uh, I didn't kind of have you do multi-tracking on the first project, but although I know some of you knew how to do multi-tracking, uh, but this is going to this project is going to require multi-tracking. It's going to require multiple layers. It's going to require multiple instruments, okay? The way you add a track in Logic is simply by this little plus icon here. That's going to bring this familiar interface back up. So you hit the plus icon. Go ahead and create another software instrument. You can create another ES1. And when you hit create, you'll see that it adds another layer here. So now I've got two tracks, first track, second track, in my project. Okay. If I need to view these a little bit more on the vertical axis, I can still use my vertical zoom to kind of see the track height here. I can also use the horizontal zoom to zoom, make it a little wider. Okay. Um, I would encourage you, oh, let's see. Logic is going to default to just calling these either by the preset or inst2. Uh, it might be, it, it, well, it will be helpful for you to get in the habit of naming things. So right now these are just simply layer one and layer two. But if I just simply double click where this word is, again, so where it says inst2, you just double click and you can type in a new name. So as you get into your projects, if you know that this layer is your drums and that layer is your bass and this layer is your your lead, it's good to good practice to name those things rather than just accepting the default inst2, which is not as descriptive or about as descriptive as what was the one like ZM0002.3 that was coming out of the, the Zoom recorder, yes, okay? So naming things is a good habit to get into, okay? So we've done real-time entry. The, on this second layer, I want to hi highlight um, manual entry, okay? So uh, we do this with the pencil tool, okay? So we're, we're doing a new tool here. Um, so how do we get to the tool palette? T, okay? And you're going to notice right below the pointer is the pencil tool, okay? Uh, if you want to start memorizing keystrokes, you can actually pretty quickly go T, P, and switch over to the pencil tool, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click in the, the track, and it's going to create an empty region or an empty clip, clip for me, okay? That clip is going to be one bar by default, one musical measure, okay? But I can grab the lower right-hand corner, and I can extend it to make it the same length as the other one, okay? But the way that I create a new region on the track is by simply taking my pencil tool and clicking, and it will create new clips for me, okay? There's nothing in those clips. They're empty. They're silent, but they're at least are they're they're like a container waiting for us to put notes in them. Okay, make sense? 
so pencil tool. So I'm going to, let me delete these other ones that I just created. Or actually, I can use the eraser tool to erase them. Keeping track, keeping four at home. Uh, now, how do we manually enter notes here? So I'm going to, um, let's see. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pick a different, um, uh, let's see, layer two. Oh, did I pick the wrong instrument? ES1? No, that's, yeah, ES1. Factory default. I'm going to go ahead and pick, I don't know, Glide Surfer. <laughs> Lovely. You can choose whichever uh, preset uh, fits your fancy for that second layer. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'm more concerned that it has a different sound than the first layer. Okay, that's the thing I'm most concerned with. Uh, but in this uh, empty region, empty clip, okay, we want to actually start entering notes, okay? If you double click on it, you're going to see a little um, a, a, a control pop, a, a, an interface pop up at the bottom. With, but Logic tries to, by default, keep everything in one window. And this is a very limited way of entering, entering notes at the bottom of the screen. See, Chase can't even see it at the back of the room because it's so low on the screen. Yes, okay, that's the problem. So I want Chase to be able to see it in the back of the room and Bryce and Sage and Kiara back there, okay? Uh, if I want a full, a bigger version of this control down here, I go to the window and it's called the piano roll, okay? So I want you to go to window, the window menu and I want you to open the piano roll that's going to give you a much bigger version of this thing at the bottom of the screen. Did that answer your question, Kara, or no? Uh, no. So I'm using the keyboard instead of like the Oh, you you have to actually uh, hide the musical keyboard. So the, the keystroke for that is Command K. So Command-K will bring it up, and Command-K will make it go away, and you can just remember that keystroke to make it hide, okay? okay that allows you to get back to the T, yes, okay? So everybody's got this big piano roll here, okay? Uh, you'll see that on the Y axis, we have something that looks kind of like a musical keyboard, yes? Can we see that? And then we have time on the X axis. What this allows us to do is if you, if you, once you're in the piano roll, if you bring your pencil tool, not your eraser tool, your pencil tool back up, you can actually enter notes into the piano roll. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. Uh, and by default, they're going to be pretty short. Okay. Once you've got them in, if you want to move them around, you have to switch back to the pointer tool, but you can grab... You can, what now? Make different notes out of this one, yes. So, um, let me zoom back out. The, the looping is still valid, actually. So if, if you hit play, okay, I didn't want a G, I wanted an E, so I picked the wrong note here, okay? So you can actually interact with these this information in the piano roll while it's playing, okay? I can grab, as long as it doesn't fly off the screen, okay? Uh, again, I'm using the pencil tool, and once I have the pencil tool, I can pencil in notes. They start off really short by default, uh, but you can... And then if you need to erase, if you've got a, an extra note that you want to get rid of, the eraser tool is your friend because you can then just erase that note, okay? T, pencil tool. So I'm, I'm just penciling in the thing I had before. Okay, zoom out. Once I've got, once I'm satisfied with this, once I'm happy with what, what I've got, I can actually close this out and I go back and play this. Lovely, I've got this nice 
canon that I've produced between these two synthesizers. Pencil tool, yes. That's what I wanted to show you today is this idea of uh, both real-time entry on a keyboard, yes. Uh, the idea of using multiple layers, multiple tracks, yes. Uh, and uh, being able to enter notes on each of them. The idea of using the piano roll and the pencil tool to enter notes as well and the fact that you can make changes to those. We're going to be talking a lot more about MIDI and MIDI data next week in terms of what change, what you can do with that MIDI information, basically. But I just wanted to kind of introduce this concept of the software synthesizers, multi-tracking, and two different ways of entering notes. Any questions about the demo that I did today? Nicholas. So there's a lot more keys, obviously, on the screen. But if you want to go like up and down octaves, are there settings on the side that you have? That? Yeah, so on these physical keyboards, uh, this is where, yeah. Uh, you actually have an octave up or down key, basically. So if you click that and it lights up, it tells you that you've actually shifted up an octave. If you click it again, it'll go up two octaves. You click it a third time, it, it just keeps going up the number of times that you've clicked it. And then to go back down, you just hit the down until it goes off, and now you're back in its normal setting. Okay? So yeah, that's the quick way to do that. All right, this is just the start. We're going to cover more of Logic next week, uh, but before...